Hello and welcome back to NPTEL National Program of Technology Enhanced Learning, a joint venture of Indian Institutes of Technology and Indian Institute of Science. As you are aware that these lectures are for students, engineering students in the IITs and engineering colleges and the role of humanities and uh, social sciences is quite uh, profound in the syllabus of engineering graduates. I am Krishna Barua, I teach uh, English literature at the department of humanities and social sciences at IIT Guwahati. It has been uh, always a pleasure to teach students and uh, coming from the technical branches mostly because literature is something uh, very remote from the technical stream. At the same time it is so closely related to what we are going to face in life. So, the purpose of the electives in uh, IITs mostly, uh, humanities electives in the IITs uh, mostly is to uh, make students study and appreciate tech appreciate the text and take delight in the representation of the world as they say it. Well, so this is a part of the, uh, the series, lecture series on literature and language. Uh, we are in the beginning of the module 4 of, uh, of literature of module 3 of the series titled History of English Literature. First lecture has already been given and uh, let us see how the first lecture was the age of uh, Saucer and now we are in the second lecture which is the age of Shakespeare. So, let us recap what we had done in the first lecture of this module. When we uh, study uh, literature, English literature for instance, we enjoy the literary journey as I had just said of poems, stories and plays which, which could be from any era or even as far back as Saucer's times. So, this awareness of the canon or the delights of the history of the English literary, literary tradition is necessary to know what is about the study of English literature. Nurturing this freedom of choice and independence of thought, we want you to be introduced to books and poems that generally reflects not only the author's life and thought, but also the spirit of the age, the environment, the history and the ideals of the nation's history. In this first lecture, we had done as a classification how we approach English literature, a specific period or culture, not that the dividing line is very, very uh, 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 strong. This lectures has attempted to look at the range of English literature, quite flexible borders as a series of scenes divided by some basic historical markers of contradictions and sometimes contra distinctions. Over the centuries, we have seen English traditions and language have been reshaped by the small islands invaders. And there will be naturally good deal in common between one scene and the next, between one age and the next age, but there will also be good deal that is different, which is being more or less marked by the economic, by the social, by the political changes that have gone through. Sometimes therefore, in forming a mental picture of a period in the past, people what do they do? They seize hold of the new features and sometimes they forget the, an over, overlap of the old. This should not be the way that we study English literature. We have to understand the connections which goes on from one age to the other. Maybe the connections are disrupted at one level, but somewhere or the other we find this, this connection forms a sort of a flow which allows one to appreciate a text or a movement in literature. As we have seen in the first lecture, 
how Great Britain had been invaded and settled many times by the Celts, by the Romans, by the Angles and the Saxons, by the Vikings, by the Normans, each bringing their own distinctive features and their cultures, their words, the important words, the way of the way they tell stories, the way they narrate things. So, whatever we think of English today as such owes something to each of these invad invaders or what you call settlements in the island. So, with beginning with Julius Caesar in 55 BC, the Britons were finally conquered by the legions of Rome during Roman rule. In the middle of the 5th century, we find the Angles sections from Germany, Jews from Denmark cross the North Sea. So, they bring the northern flavor to the English language. They drove out the old Britons before them and eventually settled on the greater part of Britain. And when we had done that old uh, English period, we have seen that the most significant work at that time was Anglo-Saxon literary work was Beowulf a Germanic uh, archetypal narrative. It consists of alliterative long lines and it was somewhere that it set the tradition of the Romance tradition in English literature. The features of this Anglo-Saxon period which we had done was that it had the love of freedom, it was responsive to nature, the strong religious conviction it had, then devotion to glory, to womanhood. And most of it was alliterative and there was a lot of uh, religious feelings and national flavor. When we come the change to the Norman conquest, we have seen that it has become mainstream European civilization. In the Norman conquest therefore, provided a convenient landmark for the history of England and the French influence and the European influence was very strong over there. And when we look into this middle English period as it was of lecture 1, we find that courtly love, Arthurian religious themes were explored, William Langland's bias plowman and the most significant one of them is Saucer's Canterbury Tales and all his works and Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. The use of allegory, the use of style, the use of English as a medium of language was for the first time used uh, uh, practiced here. And Saucer from 1340 to 1400 that was the period that we had done in lecture 1 regarded as the father of English literature rather with Saucer the English language and English literature sort of grew up and just now I had mentioned allegory which is a sort of extended uh, metaphor was the way the medieval mind characteristically worked. So, now we come to the content of lecture 2 the age of Shakespeare. So, this is a very interesting and colorful period in English literature one of the most colorful we can say in the whole period of English literature because the renaissance was just over the century and a half following the death of Saucer. 1400 to 1550 is the most volcanic period of English history and the revival of learning therefore, we have to see in its broadest sense that gradual enlightenment of the human mind of the darkness of the middle ages. So, while we are doing the age of Shakespeare, we have to understand what is the Renasa. The names Renasa in humanism which are often applied to the same movement have properly a narrower significance. It was a new humanism, it was a new exploration of the self, it was where uh, mental boundaries were almost uh, uh, broken, where specific geographical, physical and every form of area was explored. And uh, as it was, it appeared in England two greatest books, which was uh, Erasmus's Praise of Folly and Thomas More's Utopia, written in Latin, of course, were specially translated into all European languages later. In this Utopia, we find for the first time the three great words liberty, fraternity, equality. So, we come to the way that the mind worked. So, the uh, entire meaning of literature from being just imitative in the middle ages has come to become somewhere that the national fiber and the national spirit of identity had come into, into significance. So, here we are doing Elizabethan English 
or the age of Elizabeth or Shakespeare's England from 1550 to 1620. This is the period which was as I said a very golden period of English literature. After the religious economic unrest of the middle Tudor period followed the golden age of England. There was religious tolerance, there was calm. Golden ages are not all of gold naturally and they never last long. But Shakespeare sounds upon the best time and country in which to live in order to exercise with least distraction and most encouragement the highest faculties of man. And there is a saying that if there had been no Renasa, probably we would have had no Marlowe or probably we would not have had no Shakespeare. Well, so going back to the Elizabethan age is remembered as the time of a great wave of English nationalism, which I had just referred to as a domain of uh, new identity as well as the period in which the arts flourished, every form of arts. The time of Shakespeare was also the time of Elizabeth, Elizabeth who saw the rise in the concept of nationalism in uh, England and this can be seen in the increased interest that writers uh, had in writing literary and dramatic works in the English language. So, it was side by side with all cultural development. So, England's renaissance in the realm of thought and art is epitomized by the official recognition that Elizabeth first gave to Oxford and Cambridge, the first formal centers of learning and they were thriving uh, centers where all the scholars went and lot of research, a lot of uh, creative explorations were there. The invention of the printing press also in 1476, which helped to make literature more widely available, it became commercial, it was not confined to a uh, select few and therefore, pamphlets and uh, articles could be printed and there was dissemination of learning. Therefore, the arts flourished under Elizabeth I, her personal love of poetry naturally the patroness many people say that it was because of Elizabeth first patronage of arts that ultimately led it to be the golden age of English literature and theatres such as the Globe and the Rose were built and the performances took place 6 days a week mind you and plays commenced at 2 pm in the daylight playwrights were in high demand. So, people were writing plays, they are having it performed, people went to the place for entertainment and there was a lot of cultural activity going on around the playhouses. So, the Elizabethan uh, traveling uh, talks about the social history of that time and when he says that the Elizabethan English were in love with life therefore, there was a vibrancy, there was a gusto not with some theoretic, theoretic shadow of life. Large classes freed as never before from poverty, felt the upspring of the spirit and expre expressed it in wheat, music and song. And there is a saying that the Elizabethans did not talk, they sang, it was a nest of singing birds. The English language had touched its moments of fullest beauty and power, peace and order at least prevail in the land even during the sea war with Spain, relatively calm, relatively peaceful and therefore, it was the right climate for literature to strike. The Renaissance that had known a spring time long ago in its native uh, Italy where biting frost now nipped it came late to its glorious summer in this northern island. This is what Javelin says, in the days of Erasmus, the Renasa in England had been confined to scholars and to the king's court. In Shakespeare's days, it had in some part reached the people, the bible, the classic and, uh, and the classical antiqu antiquity were no longer left to the learned few. By the agency of the grammar schools, classicisms flittered through from the study into the theatre and the street. Stories were taken from the classics, from the antiques and you find Shakespeare's translation of Plutarch's lives into making historical plays. People came to know about history, became to know about Scandinavian sagas, came to know about the classical virtues and old Hebrew and Grecia Roman ways of life raised from the grave of the remote past by the magic of scholarship were open to the general understanding of Englishmen. So, it came to the masses to the very very even to the groundlings the people who were uh, not literate in the whole sense, but they could enjoy theatre 
and it was almost as if whole literature was in the grasp of the people. But as the new spheres of imagination and spiritual power to be freely converted to modern use, while Shakespeare transformed Plutarch's life into his own Julius Caesar and Antony, others took the Bible fashioned out of a new way of life and taught for religious England. So, it has been said that the age of Shakespeare, Elizabethan age, it was an age of dreams, of adventure, of unbounded enthusiasm speaking from the new lands of fabulous riches revealed by English explorers. And the young philosopher Bacon was saying confidently, okay, he was one of the foremost uh, prose uh, writers of the age and he could say, I have taken all knowledge from my province. The mind must search farther than the eye with new rich lands open to the sight. The imagination must create new forms to people, the new world. So, new worlds have to be discovered and new language have to be uh, invented. So, the literary spirit, this was the literary spirit and this is what we want to emphasize here that the Elizabethan age or the age of Shakespeare was so vibrant, it was so all pervasive and the authors were men not yet women of almost every class from distinguished courtiers like Raleigh and Sidney to the company of hack writers. There were hack writers who were prevalent, maybe not very of high standard, but who starved in garrets and hung about the outskirts of the bustling taverns. The taverns also became the centers of exchange between the high and the low. And during this reign in the late 16th and early 17th century, a London centered culture therefore rose up and it became almost the cultural capital and that was both courtly and popular produced great poetry and drama. We can even say that the beginnings of popular literature, beginning of popular culture originated in this age. So, behind the new literature was the training in classical. So, this is where we find it was a very, very uh, uh, concerted attempt that classical literature has to be transferred to the masses and there was this training almost subdued you can say in classical imitation of a long line of humanist scholars and translators reaching back to the time of Erasmus at the beginning of the century. The first tangible sign of it for the Elizabethan was the poetry of White, White and Surrey. Effective progress from songs and sonnet was delayed however, until 1579 the beginnings of the poetic vibrancy which may have been uh, imported from Italy, but we find that the sonnet form was being practiced as a courtly form and then again going into the other spheres. Spencer showed how the pastoral convention could be adapted to a variety of subjects. Edmund Spencer, the leading poet of this early uh, Elizabethan age, we find him uh, taking the form of the pastoral, going back to rural retreats, then experimenting with uh, allegory, experimenting with different types of moral heroic couplets, uh, recalling both Saucer and Virgil and he showed how the rules of decorum or fitness of style to subject could be applied to variation in the diction and metrical scheme. So, there was great experimentation in the technique of writing and he was one of the initiators you can say who uh, in the stanza form which was later called as the Spencerian stanza. Therefore, if we look first in the first phase of the Elizabethan period or the age of Shakespeare, what do we see? That Elizabethan poetry is neither classical nor romantic in the sense, it lacks the restraint and the economy, the mental repose of the finest classical art, not so much applying it to the norms and the rules of the classical rules, but equally it joins labor and learning to enthusiasm. This marriage between imagination and decorum, this marriage between classicism and romanticism was one of the main uh, important contributions to English literature. Following the main tradition of antiquity and the middle ages, it is addressed to reason as a universal moral guide. It is composed on the assumption that the function of poetry is to teach by delighting. So, delight is the main occupation to interpret nature and to influence man's action. This connection between nature, between man's morals and to man's the purpose of man's action. 
Though the age produced some excellent prose work, we just mentioned Francis Bacon, it is essentially an age of poetry. I have said that it was the nest of singing birds and the poetry is remarkable for its variety. It is not in one line, it is a different different experiments that were going on. Its freshness is youthful and romantic feeling. Both the poetry and the drama were permeated by Italian influence no doubt. So, this influences we cannot do away and we find that which was dominant in English literature from Saucer to the restoration. So, the Italian influence which was there, the European influence had a very significant part in the making of uh, poetry of the time. The literature of this age is often called the literature of the Renaissance too. Though as we have seen the Renaissance itself began much earlier for a century and a half before. So, now let us look at this flowering of lyric poetry in the reign of Elizabeth. Okay? We have just mentioned Sir Thomas White, greatly influenced by the Italian Petrarch introduces the sonnet and a range of short lyrics to English. The sonnet form a line a poem in 14 lines with four quatrains and followed by a couplet you find was a new form that was introduced. Then Earl of Surrey develops unripe pentameters or blank verse thus inventing the verse form which will be of great use to contemporary dramatists. Now, now, so in order to appreciate exactly what this importance is, we must remember in what state White and Saray found the art which they practiced in and which they made a new start in early Tudor lyric poetry. Yes, and that is why their place in the early flowering of lyric poetry is almost it is uh, something so strong that it has gone into the making of many of the other later poets. We have Sir Philip Sidney with his Astrophil and Stella and Edmund Spencer which we, we had just referred to one of the leading poets of the time and especially his magnum opus Fairy Queen and Allegory. Then we have Sir Walter Raleigh, the courtiers, they were courtiers, they were also practicing poets. Christopher Marlowe and also William Shakespeare and especially Shakespeare's early poetry as well as his sonnets. The Fairy Queen if we look into Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen, it is a great work upon which the poet's fame chiefly rests. And this is the original, original plan of the poem included 24 books, each of which was to recount the adventure and triumph of a knight who represented a moral virtue allegorical representation of vice or virtue. Where Sosa looks about him and describes life as he sees it, we had seen in Canterbury, Canterbury Trails, here Spencer always looks backward for his inspiration. He goes back to the medieval age. He lives dreamily, <coughs> sorry, he lives dreamily in the past, in the realm of purely imaginary imag emotions and adventures. We can even call it an alternate reality he goes into the realm of creates a different atmosphere, a different ambience and his first quality therefore, is imagination. If we look at Spencer and you compare it with Saucer, you find the contrast which is there. Saucer was so realistic in detail almost to the point of, uh, of, uh, of uh, miniature figures in representation. Here we find that it is imagination and he is the first of our poets to create a world of dreams, fancies, illusions. We can almost align him to the world of magic realism which are the modern form of narratives. For the fairy queen Spencer invented a new verse form which has been called since his day the Spencerian stanza. Because of its rare beauty, it has been much used by nearly all the poets of English literature. New stanza was an improved form of Aristo's autoverima and bears a close resemble to one of Saucer's most musical verse forms in the monk's tale. So, this is where I want to show, this is Edmund Spencer, I want to show you how the age that goes before or the influences which come in and this is what uh, uh, Eliot, uh, T. S. Eliot uh, in his essay tradition and individual talent had emphasized that you have to have the historical sense to understand the flow of literature and to appreciate a text in its full form. 
and this is where the exchanges and the influences which have gone before or maybe which have may have been concurrent with the times is uh, very important in understanding a text or a movement. So, the greatness of Shakespeare's achievement if we look into him as one of the poets who had been the uh, uh, very uh, great prominence in the early part of the Tudor age was largely made possible by the work of his immediate predecessors by Spencer, Sidney in the mastery of verse, for example, by Marlowe and the university wits in the theatrical management of character and situation when he goes to drama. So, he was fortunate that almost the initial work had been done for him. Therefore, Shakespeare began his literary career as a poet and, um, and he never ceased to be fascinated by the poetic possibilities of image and conceit, metaphor and symbol. Shakespeare also popularized the English sonnet which made significant changes uh, to um, Petrarch's model and his use of prose for comic ironic mad or simplified uh, forms. Yeah, the, when we look at a review of Shakespeare's poems, we will be doing his dramas later when we are doing that phase of Elizabethan, pro, uh, Elizabethan drama. Here we are studying Shakespeare's uh, place in his contribution to the poetry. Excluding the sonnets, we find that he had written Venus and Adonis long poems, Rape of Lucrece and a few and uncertain, but exquisite scraps in the lover's complaint, the passionate pilgrim and so forth. All these are likely to have been the work of early youth, maybe immature, but even then we have extreme sweetness and abundance. Now, when we come to the 154 sonnets of Shakespeare's whole uh, over, then we find that it is a class apart. Elizabethan uh, English or you can say Elizabethan poetry in the age of Shakespeare we find is mostly the, uh, the way that the whole sonnet form was experimented upon and when we study Shakespeare's sonnets, it is one of the luminaries of that period and they are the only direct expression of the poet's own feelings that we possess for its exquisite beauty, for its exquisite thematic expression. I do not think there will be any sonnets which can equal his own. A line from here sonnet, let me not to the marriage of true minds admits impediments, love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. He even modified the sonnet structure and made it into his own and not the way that White and Surrey had written or the Petrarchan model, his own model and there we find that it had from then on it came to be known as the Shakespearean sonnet. Well, when we look into the phase of, uh, of prose writing in this period, it was an inevitable result of the discovery of printing that the cultivation of the vernacular for purposes of all work that is to say for prose should be largely increased. The most interesting monuments of this crusade as it may almost be called, called in England are concerned with the school of Cambridge scholars who flourished at that time such as Assam, Wilson and others. So, the history of earlier Elizabethan prose is to a great extent the history of curiosities of literature, right? of tentative and imperfect efforts scarcely resulting in any real vernacular style at all. It was not as colorful as we can say about the early attempts at poetry, but at the same time very significant. It is however, emphatically the period of origins of modern English prose. If we study modern English prose, we find the initial uh, steps were during this period and as such cannot but be interesting noticing the schools of historians, translators, controversialists and specially critics who illustrated the middle period of the reign and singing out, singling out Sidney and Lyle. So, when we refer to Roger Essam, his Toxophilus was written and printed as early as 1545. Let me quote from this text what he had written which is quite interesting. I have written this English matter in the English tongue for Englishmen. This is what he wrote, a memorable sentence none the worse for jingle and repetition which are well in place. 
until scholars like Assam, who with the rarest exception were the only person likely or able to write at all, get to write English matters in English tongue. For Englishmen, the formation of the English prose style was impossible. So, they took this risk of writing in the English tongue and that it required some courage to do so. A quote here, I am of this opinion that our own tongue should be written clean and pure, unmixed and unmingled with borrowing of other tongues, wherein if we take not heed by time, ever borrowing and never paying, she shall be fain to keep her house as bankrupt. Go, beautiful metaphor that is used. We come to Francis Bacon, his safe philosophical world is the Institutorio Magna, which was left incomplete, which includes the advancement of learning and the novum organum, but mostly for students of literature, his interest as a pioneer is in his famous essays called the pioneer of modern science and the inductive method of learning. Minor prose writers at that time are Richard Hooker, Travelogues, etc., John Fox, the historians Camden and Knox, the editors Hacklute and Burches, who gave the stirring records of exploration, and Thomas Snod, the translator of Plutarch's life. John Lyley has to be mentioned here not only as a dramatist, but as a prose writer, especially his Euphius, which was divided into two parts. Euphius, the anatomy of wit and Euphus and his England is a kind of love story, yes, but yet the action however, being next to nothing, uh, it uh, infinite amount of moral and courtly discourse has been given here. Now, two schools of English prose showed itself on one side in Lyle and the university wits of his time. The university wits were this group of scholars who were also writers who were in the universities of Cambridge and Oxford. On the other, in the extremely vernacular and sometimes extremely vulgar manner of the pamphleters. So, we have prose of different types, one which were the uh, scholarly or more uh, conscious prose of the university wits and also of the pamphleters who were uh, uh, closer maybe to the way the colloquial English and the vul vulgar manner of the pamphleters. We have to mention Philip Sidney yet again because his prose work are the famous pastoral romances of the Arcadia, written to please his sister, is full of generous ardor, it has a different style altogether and we find there are in this full of poetic expression. So, the, the borderline between prose and poetry is somewhere mingled together. So, the apology for poetry is one of the first critical essays in English, how to write a poem, what is this discourse in the poetic essay. The Arcadia is interspersed with ecologues in which sephers and sephardesses sing of the delights of rural life. Now, the transition in the mid 15th century, after we come to the drama now, after doing the poets in a very uh, general manner, the phase of poetry as well as a prose, let us come to the acme of representation in, uh, in the Elizabethan age and go back to how did drama take place. After the mystery and the miracle plays, which had its bearings uh, in the late 14th century, we find a new type of drama emerged called the morality plays. Of the English drama from miracles to the moralities was however, quite spontaneous. It began in the search as we had done in the first lecture and we have seen that how it went into the suburbs and the transition from the scriptural figures of the former from the mystery and the miracle to the abstractions of the later where we had uh, rise to the Coventry cycles, because the search found that the theme of, this, uh, of the dramas which were uh, enacted somehow could not be put into the confines of the search. So, it came into the cycles. In the evolution of British drama, this transition from the mystery to the morality forms the third stage. Of all the moral plays of medieval England, the most celebrated and recognized one is Everyman the mention must be made of every man. Before the 16th century English drama therefore, meant the amateur performances of Bible stories by craft guilds on public holidays. Well, so to trace the earliest beginnings of the English theatre in the reigns of the four first Tudors, the mystery and morality passed into the interlude as we have seen, 
Even the two famous comedies, Ralph Royster Doyster and Gamma Garden's Needle, stand as if it were only at the threshold of a period, not so much of of uh, experimentation going on and somewhere it was in the in between lines between one period and the other. On the other hand, we can take on to our province the whole rise, flourishing and decadence of the extraordinary product known somewhat loosely as the Elizabethan drama. So, first English tragedy Gorbudak was written by Thomas Sackville and Thomas Norton and was acted in 1562. This is a very important date in Elizabethan drama, only two years before the birth of Shakespeare. It is remarkable not only as England's first tragedy, but as the first play to be written in blank verse. So, the blank verse of Shakespeare, the later being most significant since it started the drama into the style of verse best suited to the genius of English playwrights. Blank verse became almost the, the, the most representative tool for drama writing. So, it was the influence of the continent that the Renaissance came to English theatre. The English drama like other literary branches had the enlivening influence from Italy. You had seen the Italian influence in the sonnets. Now, we see that the Italian influence was equally strong in the way drama was uh, written and the way the plays were performed. From the medieval mystery and mor morality plays, there was a sweeping advancement now to the division into, uh, into genres like comedies, tragedies and history plays. So, now we find this variety of genres that are being uh, opened up. The main source of inspiration of the English tragedy was therefore, if we look at tragedy of that time, it was Seneca a Latin dramatist of the age of Nero. The first English tragedy Gorbuda, Cofarex and Porex written by Thomas Norton was of the Senecan type. What was this Senecan influence? Right? So, it was characterized by themes of revenge, lots of melodrama, bombastic uh, melodrama. Chorus would be there who would moralize, but do not participate. It would open with a chorus, maybe a group or a single person and the five act structure has come in, ghost would come in seeking revenge, supernatural elements are there, the stock characters would be there, different ways that they will be representing the types, they will be introspective moralizing hero who would be uh, talking about his own dilemma or his turmoil and therefore, there will be a lot of soliloquies which will come soliloquies like interior monologues and you will find that this is how it went the Seneca influence more or less somewhere or the other influence Shakespeare too. And a style which was characterized by bombast, rant, description, soliloquies, a villain who is possessed and a lot of melodrama and a lot of pageantry would be there on the stage, which the people liked a lot. Okay. Thomas Keats the Spanish tragedy it sets off a wave of limit imitations that set the standard for Elizabethan tragedy. It was the most popular play of the era. So, the underlying theme of the great part of Elizabethan literature, if we look into this uh, aspect, is a conflict between the demonstrative individualism and the traditional sense of a moral order. There was not a negating of the traditional sense, but at the same time the exploring of the what is new. Humanism alone was not the source of vitality in Shakespeare's theatre. Its vitality was due. Now, the most important part in understanding Elizabethan theatre was contact with popular entertainment. I think I referred to you that it may have been during this age that the origins of popular culture had come in and by popular culture you mean that the literature becomes the possession of each one of us, every one of us, it is not of an elite all right, and therefore, popular entertainment and popular thinking. So, it was not just humanism, it was not just tradition, it was this concern with the people or concern of disseminating ideas to the people that it was one of the most significant factors in understanding uh, Elizabethan drama. Weakened by the reformation, grammar schools, universities had trained the students in rhetoric with the aid of Seneca, Terence uh, or modern Latin imitation. 
among the university of its now we had talked about this group of of stars which had been the myths of so much of controversy in the universities, we have Christopher Marlowe. Christopher Marlowe's work and many people say that as a dramatist and as a poet, I think there was if there is a parallel with Shakespeare, only Marlowe's name can be somehow referred to that too not as close to what people would like to. Uh, make the comparison apply philosophical depth. In the classic play, the so called dramatic unity is what had happened in the classic plays of that time. The dramatic unities of time, place and action were strictly observed. It has to be in, in a single day, the time also has to be of a particular time and the action has to be without any subplots, without any uh, uh, parallel plots. The English drama on the other hand strove to represent the whole sweep of life in a single play. The university to school or uh, university which as men of learning were called generally of drama upheld the classical ideal yes and ridiculed the crudeness of the new English plays. In the end the native drama prevailed aided by the popular taste which had been trained by four centuries of miracles. The English first play especially the romantic type were extremely crude and often led to ridiculously extravagant scenes. So, these two rival schools of the university wits and the actor playwrights one who experimented more with popular taste and one who had more with the classical norms of representation uh, and that uh, the first in Marlowe, the second in Shakespeare. We have two leading, okay. we have Shakespeare and Marlowe. A second phase will show us the triumph of the untrammeled English play in tragedy and comedy furnished by Marlowe with the mighty line, his blank verse, but free to a great extent from the bombast and the unreal scheme which he did not shake off. Side by side if we study Shakespeare, we will find we have to deal with the learned plays of Johnson again who comes as a contemporary as also one of his uh, later dramatists. The proud full style of Chapman we have Marston and Decker. Therefore, Ranasa drama if we have seen in the early stages or the Elizabethan stage the first great English dramatist is Christopher Marlowe. Forget about Thomas Kidd. He was, he had based his uh, uh, Spanish tragedy, of course, on Seneca model, most popular, yes, but in the full form of national theatre, the first great English dramatist is Marlowe. Marlowe's plays, Tambulin, Dr. Foster's, Edward II, Jew of Malta, used a 5 X structure and the medium of blank verse which Shakespeare finds so productive. So, he was a learner in the way that he used the techniques of dynamic dramatic representation. And of course, if Marlowe's Dr. Foster's, if you read Dr. Foster's tragedy of Dr. Foster's, even the lines will always will be mesmerizing in the use of the complete declamatory style of the blank verse. And it is said to be the first great tragedy of humanism and the story of Faustus was taken from a popular pamphlet which was reproduced in ballad form as well. It retraces the allegorical struggle between good and evil of early moralities though with the highly important difference that the central figure is no longer mankind, but an individual hero. Therefore, we find that it is almost a representation of individual humanism or individual tragedy not like a type in morality plays, though it takes on the themes of the morality plays this conflict between good and evil. This is a quote from Dr. Foster's, Foster's asked how comes it then that thou art out of hell to Mephistopheles the devil. Mephistopheles says why this is hell nor am I out of it. This will be almost a prelude to the depiction of hell when we have in Milton's paradise lost. In the powerful Jew of Malta we have the same sort of presiding spirit of Machiavelli, Machiavellian hero who uh, stoops to no ends to achieve his goal. And of course, there is a change in the individual destiny and so that violence takes on a coloring of grotesque satire. Robert Greene was one of the first men of letters to make his profession another uh, compatriot and uh, a broad reading public. 
the best of his plays, Friar Bacon and Friar Bungay and James Fort, are romantic medleys in which he seems to have been experimenting with the possibilities of varieties in a double or multiple plots. We cannot but mention Johnson's Every Man in His Humor, the drama of humors, which was performed in 1598, and here especially important, remarkable is Shakespeare was also in the cast. He became celebrity because of his humorous comedy and uh, every man out of his humor were satirical comedies displaying Johnson's classical learning and his interest in formal experiment. Perhaps the most famous playwright in the world, we come to William Shakespeare from Stratford upon Avon wrote plays that are still performed in theaters across the world to this day. He was himself an actor, we have named the age, the age of Shakespeare and how he was deeply involved in the running of the theatrical company. He had no formal training like the university weeds. His 38 plays include tragedies such as Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, comedies such as Midsummer's Night Dream, Twelfth Night and history plays such as Henry Ford part 1 and 4. He has been called the central son. It was in this world that William Shakespeare wrote and acted in his plays in the late 16th and early 17th centuries. And Shakespeare's earliest identified plays, his apprentice work shows his interest in a variety of Elizabethan dramatic tradition, the, as I told you the history plays as well as Thomas Kidd's uh, uh, Seneca influence. He was therefore, a very much a man of his time a man of the Elizabethan theatre, who learned to exploit brilliantly the stagecraft, the acting, the public taste of his day. So, he was a consummate dramatist, who could fill the pulse of the nation, of the people. It happens very rarely in the history of literature, that a craftsman, who has a quite perfect control of his medium, and his masterly ease in handling the techniques and convention of his day is also a universal genius of the highest order. One who was so localized, one who wanted to uh, keep the pulse of the nation of the people at the same time used universal themes. And unique ability to render experience in poetic language and an uncanny intuitive understanding of human psychology. So, Elizabethan tragedy we find there was a change here, there was character which makes a man not fate is destiny, but character is destiny and it is less concerned with genre mixing of comedy and tragedy often character centered rather than plot centered. The history plays we have seen how he had made popular morality satirizing abuses and then he comes into no, writing about historical figures, which comes close to the people. So, now, when we look into the overview of the drama of the age, there was the overview of drama for its originality, volume, generic resemblance of character, individual independence of trait, exuberance of inventive thought, the Elizabethan drama stands alone in the history of the world. And Shakespeare is supposed to be the only commenter on Shakespeare, this is what one critic has said. He is unequal as life is and this is the extraordinary and almost inexplicable difference, not merely between him and all his contemporaries, but between him and all other writers. Every writer that you will be doing in this course or maybe you will be uh, accounting in the ages that will follow, you will find that he is always at the height of the particular situation. And this unique quality is uniquely illustrated in his plays. He was not of an age, but for all time. His successors were Ben Johnson, Beaumont and Fletcher, Webster, Middleton, Haywood, Decker. So, we had done with the non-dramatic poets like uh, Edmund Spencer, Spencer, the Thomas Sack, uh, Sackville, Michael Drayton and Philip Sidney. We had an uh, overview of the rise of the drama in England, the miracle plays. We had an overview of Shakespeare's predecessors, Lyle Kate, Nash, Pale, Green, Marlowe, the university weights, the types of drama with which they experimented. We had an overview of the prose writers in which Francis Bacon dominated and such an age of thought and feeling as we have seen and vigorous section finds its best expression in the drama and at the center of the drama was Shakespeare and Shakespeare's successors and therefore, 
in concluding we say Shakespeare's period is generally regarded as the greatest in the history of English literature. Historically therefore, we note in this age the tremendous impetus received from the renaissance, from the reformation and from the exploration of the new world. It was marked by a strong national spirit, by patriotism, by religious tolerance, by social content, by intellectual progress and by unbounded enthusiasm. So, the discussion of the stories when you look into it, we can look into the significance of white and Surrey in the poetical representation and how the age was mainly dominated by the spirit of uh, romance and how the age of Shakespeare was in part a period of experimentation and the rise and concept of nationalism. These are some of the referred texts G. M. Travelling English Social History, which is very important for understanding the social conditions of any age and the Cambridge history of English literature and uh, David Dices and some of the other books which are mentioned here.